He who of old would rend the yoke, dreamed not of the rebound, chained by the trunk he vainly broke, alone, how looked he round? Byron. Reason and moderation in the person of Rizal scorned and banished. The spirit of John Paul Marat and John Brown of Osawatomi rises to the fore in the shape of one Andres Bonifacio, warehouse porter, who sits up of nights copying all the letters and documents that he can lay hands on, composing grandiloquent manifestos in Tagalog, drawing up magnificent appointments in the names of prominent persons who would lay their suffer even to the shedding of their life's blood through his mania for writing history in advance spelling out Spanish tales of the French Revolution, babbling of liberty, equality, and fraternity, hinting darkly to his confidence that the president of France had begun life as a blacksmith. Only a few days after Rizal was so summarily hustled away, Bonifacio gathered together a, gr a crowd of malcontents and ignorant dupes, some of them composing as choice a gang of cutthroats as ever slit the gullet of a Chinese or tied mutilated prisoners in ant hills and solemnly organized the kataas-taasang kagalanggalangang katipunan ng mga anak ng bayan. Supreme Select Association of the Sons of the People for the extermination of the ruling race and the restoration of the Golden Age. It was to bring the people into concerned action for a general revolt on a fixed date when they would rise simultaneously, take possession of the city of Manila, and the rest were better left to the imagination, for they had been reared under the Spanish, Spanish colonial system and imitativeness has ever been pointed out as a cardinal trait in the Filipino character. No quarter was to be asked or given, and the most sacred ties even of consanguinity, were to be disregarded in the general slaughter. To the inquiry of a curious neophyte as to how the Spaniards were to be distinguished from the other Europeans in order to avoid international complications, Dark Andres replied that in case of doubt they should proceed with due caution, but should take good care that they made no mistakes about letting any of the Castillas escape their vengeance. The higher officials of the government were to be taken alive as hostages, while the friars were to be reserved for a special holocaust on Bagumbayan Field, where over their incinerated remains a heaven-kissing monument would be erected. This Katipunan seems to be an outgrowth from the Spanish Freemasonry, introduced into the Philippines by a Spaniard named Moraita and Marcelo H. del Pilar, a native of Bulacan province who was the practical leader of the Filipinos in Spain, but who died there in 1896, just as he was setting out for Hong Kong to mature his plans for a general uprising to expel the friar orders. There had been some Masonic societies in the islands for some time, but the membership had been limited to peninsulars, and they played no part in the politics of the time. But about 1888, Filipinos began to be admitted into some of them, and later, chiefly through the exertions of Pilar, lodges exclusively for them were instituted. These soon began to display great activity, especially in the transcendental matter of collections, so that their existence became a source of care to the government and a nightmare to the religious orders. From them, and with a perversion of the idea and results still born Liga, it was an easy transition to the Katipunan, which was to put aside all pretense of reconciliation with Spain, and at the appointed time rise to exterminate not only the friars but also all the Spaniards and Spanish sympathizers, thus to bring about the reign of liberty, equality, and fraternity under the benign guidance of Patriot Bonifacio with his bolo for a scepter. With its secrecy and mystic forms, its methods of threats and intimidation, the Katipunan spread rapidly, especially among the Tagalogs, the most intransigent of the native peoples. And it should be noted, the ones in whose territory the friars were the principal landlords. It was organized on the triangle plan, so that no member might know or communicate with more than three others, the one above him from whom he received his inf information and instructions and two below to whom he transmitted them. The initiations were conducted with great secrecy and solemnity, 
calculated to inspire the new members with awe and fear. The initiate, after a series of blood-curdling ordeals to try out his courage and resolution, swore on a human skull on a terrific oath to devote his life and energies to the extermination of the white race, regardless of age or sex, and later affixed to it his signature or mark, usually the latter, with his own blood taken from an incision on the left arm or left breast. This was one form of the famous blood compact, which, if history reads aright, played so important a part in the assumption of sovereignty over the Philippines by Legazpi in the name of Philip II. Rizal was made the honorary president of the association. His portrait hung in all the meeting halls, and the magic of his name used to attract the easily deluded masses, who were in a state of agitated ignorance and growing unrest, ripe for any movement that looked anti-governmental and especially anti-Spanish. Soon after the organization had been perfected, collections began to be taken up, but those collections were never overlooked. For the purpose of chartering a steamer to rescue him from the beaten and transport him to Singapore, whence he might direct the general uprising, the day and the hour for which were fixed by Bonifacio for August 26, 1896, at 6 o'clock sharp in the evening, since lack of precision in his magnificent programs was never a fault of that bold patriot, his logic being as severe as that of the Filipino policeman who put the flag at half-mast on Good Friday. Of all this, Rizal himself was, of course, completely ignorant, until in May 1896, a Filipino doctor named Pio Valenzuela, a creature of Bonifacio's, was dispatched to Dapitan, taking along a blind man as a pretext for the visit to, a, to the famous oculist to lay the plans before him for his consent and approval. Rizal expostulated with Val Valenzuela, for a time over such a mad and hopeless venture, which would only bring ruin and misery upon the masses, and then is said to have very humanly lost his patience, ending the interview in so bad a humor and with words so offensive that the deponent, who had gone with the intention of remaining there a month, took the steamer on the following day for return to Manila. He reported secretly to Bonifacio, who bestowed several choice Tagalog epithets on Rizal and charged his envoy to say nothing about the failure of his mission, but rather to give the impression that he had been successful. Rizal's name continued to be used as a shibboleth of the ins insurrection, and the masses were made to believe that he would appear as their leader at the appointed hour. Vague reports from police officers to the effect that something unusual in the nature of secret societies was going on among people began to reach the government, but no great attention was paid to them until the evening of August 19th when the parish priest of Tondo was informed by the mother superior of one of the convent schools that she had just learned of a plot to massacre all the Spaniards. She had the information from a devoted pupil whose brother was a compositor in the office of the Diario de Manila. As is so frequently the case in Filipino families, families, this elder sister was the purse holder, and the brother's insistent requests for money, which was needed by him to meet the repeated assessments made on the members as the critical hour approached, awakened her curiosity and suspicion to such an extent that she forced him to confide the whole plan to her. Without delay, she divulged it to her patroness, who in turn notified the curate of Tondo, where the printing office was located. The priest called in two officers of the civil guard who arrested the young printer, frightened the confession out of him, and that night, in company with the prior, searched the printing office, finding secreted there several lithographic plates for printing receipts and certificates of membership in the Katipunan, with a number of documents giving some account of the plot. Then the Spanish population went wild. General Ramon Blanco was governor and seems to have been about the only person who kept his head at all. He tried to prevent giving so irresponsible a movement a fictitious importance, but was utterly powerless to stay the clamor for blood which at once arose, loudest on the part of those alleged ministers of the gentle Christ.
for the gates of the old walled city long fallen into disuse were cleaned and put in order. Martial law was declared and wholesale arrests made. Many of the prisoners were confined in Fort Santiago, one batch being crowded into a dungeon for which the only ventilation was a gated opening at the top. And one night, a sergeant of the guard carelessly spread his sleeping mat over this, so the next morning some fifty-five asphyxiated corpses were hauled away. On the 26th, armed insurrection broke out at Caloacan, just north of Manila. From time immemorial, the resort of bad characters from all the country round in the center of brigandage, while at San Juan del Monte, on the outskirts of the city, several bloody skirmishes were fought a few days later with the Guardia Civil Veterana, the picked police force. Bonifacio had been warned of the discovery of his schemes in time to make his escape and flee to the barrio or village of Balintawak, a few miles north of Manila, thence to lead the attack on Caloacan and inaugurate the reign of liberty, equality, and fraternity in the manner in which Philippine insurrections have generally had a habit of starting, with the murder of Chinese merchants and the pillage of their shops. He had from the first reserved for himself the important office of treasurer in the Katipunan, in addition to being on occasions president and at all times its ruling spirit, so he now established himself as a dictator and proceeded to appoint a magnificent staff, most of whom contrived to escape as soon as they were out of reach of his bolo. Yet he drew considerable numbers about him, for this man, though almost entirely unlettered, seems to have been quite a personality among his own people, especially possessed of that gift of oratory in his native tongue to which the Malay is so preeminently susceptible. In Manila, a special tribunal was constituted and worked steadily, sometimes through the siesta hour, for there were times of which this was one when even Spanish justice should be swift. Bagumbayan began to be a veritable field of blood, as the old methods of repression were resorted to for the purpose of striking terror into the native population by wholesale executions nor did the ruling powers realize that the time for such methods had passed. It was a case of 16th century colonial methods falling into fretful and frantic senility, so in all this wretched business it is doubtful whim to pivot the more. The blind stupidity of the fossilized conservatives incontinently throwing an empire away, forfeiting their influence over a people whom they, by temperance and experience, should have been fitted to control and govern, or the potential cruelty of perverted human nature in the dark Frankenstein who would wreck upon the rulers in their decadent days the most hideous of the methods in the system that produced him, as he planned his festive holocaust and car manual on the spot where every spark of initiative and leadership among his people, both good and bad, had been summarily and ruthlessly extinguished. There is at least a world of reflection in it for the rulers of men. In the meantime, Rizal, wearying of the quiet life in the Pitan and doubtless foreseeing the impending catastrophe, had requested to leave to volunteer his services as a physician in the military hospitals of Cuba of the horrors and sufferings in which he had heard. General Blanco at once gladly acceded to this request and had him brought to Manila, but unfortunately the boat carrying him arrived there a day too late for him to catch the regular August mail steamer to Spain, so he was kept in the cruiser as a prisoner of war, awaiting the next transportation. While he was thus detained, the Katipunan plot was discovered and the rebellion broke out. He was accused of being the head of it, but Blanco gave him a personal letter completely exonerating him from any complicity in the outbreak, as well as a letter of recommendation to the Spanish Minister of War. He was placed on the Isla de Panay when it left for Spain on September 3rd and traveled at first as a passenger. At Singapore, he was advised to land and claim British protection, as did some of his fellow travelers, but he refused to do so, saying that his conscience was clear. As the name of Rizal had constantly recurred during the trials of the Katipunan suspects, the military tribunal finally issued a formal demand for him. 
the order of arrest was cabled to port side and resolve their place in solitary confinement for the remainder of the voyage. Arrived at Barcelona, he was confined in the grim fortress of Montjuic, where, by a curious coincidence, the government was the same Despujols who had issued the decree of banishment in 1892. Shortly afterwards, he was placed on the transport Colon, which was bound for the Philippines with troops, Blanco having at last steered into action. Strenuous efforts were now made by Rizal's friends in London to have him removed from the ship at Singapore, but the British authorities declined to take any action on the ground that he was on a Spanish warship and therefore beyond the jurisdiction of their courts. The Colon arrived at Manila on November 3rd and Rizal was imprisoned in Fort Santiago, while a special tribunal was constituted to try him on the charges of carrying on anti-patriotic and anti-religious propaganda rebellion, sedition, and the formation of illegal associations. Some other charges may have been overlooked in the hurry and excitement. It would be almost a travesty to call a trial the proceedings which began early in December and dragged along on the, until the 26th. Rizal was defended by a young Spanish officer selected by him from among a number designated by the tribunal, who chivalrously performed so unpopular a duty as well as he could. But the whole affair was a mockery of justice, for the Spanish government in the Philippines had finally and hopelessly reached the condition graphically, graphically pictured by Mr. Kipling. Panic that shells the drifting spar, loud waste with none to check, mad fear that wakes a scornful star or sweeps a concert's deck. The clamor against Blanco had resulted in his summary removal by royal decree and the appointment of a real pacificator, Camilo Polovieja. While in prison, Rizal prepared an address to those of his countrymen who were in the armed rebellion, repudiating the use of his name and deprecating the resort to violence. The closing words are a compendium of his life and beliefs. Countrymen, I have given proofs as well as the best of you, of desiring liberty for our country, and I continue to desire it. But I place as a premise the education of the people, so that by means of instruction and work they may have a personality of their own, and that they may take themselves worthy of that same liberty. In my writings, I have recommended the study of civic virtues, without which there can be no redemption. I have also written, and my words have been repeated, that reforms to be fruitful must come from above, that those which spring from below are uncertain and insecure movements. Imbued with these ideas, I cannot do less than condemn, and I do condemn this absurd, savage rebellion planned behind my back, which dishonors the Filipinos and discredits those who can speak for us. I abominate all criminal actions and refuse any kind of participation in them, pitying with all my heart the dupes who have allowed themselves to be deceived. Go back, then, to your homes, and may God forgive those who have acted in bad faith. This address, however, was not published by the Spanish authorities, since they did not consider it patriotic enough. Instead, they killed the writer. Rizal appeared before the tribunal bound, closely guarded by two peninsular soldiers, but maintained his serenity throughout and an answered the charges in a straightforward way. He pointed out the fact that he had never taken any great part in politics, having even quarreled with Marcelo del Pilar, the active leader of the anti-clericals, by reason of those perennial subscriptions and that during the time he was accused of being the instigator and organizer of armed rebellion, he had been a close prisoner in the Pitan, under strict surveillance by both the military and ecclesiastical authorities. The prosecutor presented a lengthy document which ran mostly towards about the only definite conclusion laid down in it being that the Philippines are, and always must remain, Spanish territory. What there may have been in Rizal's career to hang such a conclusion upon is not quite clear. 
but at any rate, this learned legal light was evidently still thinking in colors on a map, serenely unconscious in his European pseudo pre science of the new and wonderful development in the Western Hemisphere. Humanity militant Lincolnism. The death sentence was asked, but the longer the case dragged on, the more favorable it began to look for the accused. So the president of the tribunal, after deciding, Jeffreys like, that the charges had been proved, ordered that no further evidence be taken. Rizal betrayed some sunrise when his doom was thus foreshadowed. For, dreamer that he was, he seems not to have anticipated such a fatal eventuality for himself. He did not lose his serenity, however, even when the tribunal promptly brought in a verdict of guilty and imposed the death sentence, upon which Polavieja the next day placed his complace fixing the morning of December 30th for the execution. So Rizal's fate was sealed. The witnesses against him, insofar as there was any substantial testimony at all, had been his own countrymen, coerced or cajoled into making statements which they have since repudiated as false and which in some cases were extorted from them by threats and even torture. But he betrayed very little emotion, even maintaining what must have been an assumed cheerfulness. Only one reproach is recorded, that he had been made a dupe of, that he had been deceived by everyone, even the banqueros and cocheros. His old Jesuit instructors remained with him in the capilla or death cell, and largely through the influence of an image of the Sacred Heart, which he had carved as a schoolboy, it is claimed that a reconciliation with the church was effected. There has been considerable pragmatical discussion as to what form of retraction from him was necessary. Since he had been, after studying in Europe, a frank free thinker, but such futile polemics may safely be left to the learned doctors. That he was reconciled with the church would seem to be evidenced by the fact that just before the execution he gave legal status as his wife to the woman, a rather remarkable Eurasian adventuress who had lived with him in the Pitan and the religious ceremony was the only one then recognized in the islands. The greater part of his last night on earth was spent in composing a chain of verse, no very majestic flight of poesy, but a pathetic monody throbbing with patient resignation and inextinguishable hope, one of the sweetest, saddest swan songs ever sung. Thus he was left at the last, entirely alone. As soon as his doom became certain, the patriots had all scurried to cover, one gentle poet taster even rushing into doggerel verse to condemn him as a reversion to barbarism. The wealthier suspects betook themselves to other lands or made judicious use of their money bags among the Spanish officials. The better classes of the population floundered hopelessly, leaderless, in the confused whirl of opinions and passions, while the voiceless min millions for whom he had spoken moved on in dumb, uncomprehending silence. He had lived in that higher dreamland of the future, ahead of his countrymen, ahead even of those who assumed to be the mentors of his people, and he must learn, as does every noble soul, soul that labors to make the bounds of freedom wider yet, the bitter lesson that nine-tenths, if not all, the woes that afflict humanity spring from man's own stupid selfishness, that the wresting of the scepter from the tyrant is often, is often the least of the task, that the bondman comes to love his bonds like Chilon's prisoner, his very chains, and he grow friends, but that the struggle for human freedom must go on, at whatever cost, in ever-widening circles. Wave after wave, each mightier than the last, for as long as one body toils in fetters or one mind welters in blind ignorance, either of the slave's base delusion or the despot's specious illusion, there can be no final security for any free man or his children or his children's children.